That is wrong. So, hello and welcome to this complex system seminar in the course of complex system seminars and the master's program Complex Adaptive Systems here at Chalmers. Uh, my name is Kola Retzner and I will talk to you about introductory game theory and uh, bring up some examples. For example, El Faro Bar Problem and the Prisoner's Dilemma and a couple more. Uh, this is the outline for the presentation. I will start out by the, introducing the Prisoner's Dilemma and how we can think and reason about this. Then I will move on to some uh, Wikipedia-style trivia about game theory, some applications, and then loads more examples, and then I will end it all with showing you some models. So, moving on. Prisoner's Dilemma. Well, the setup for the Prisoner's Dilemma is the following. Two uh, convicts, A and B, they have been arrested by the police. But the police, they don't have enough evidence to charge them with the principal crime, so they are going to charge them with the lesser crime making this prison sentence only one year. Now, the police, they offer these prisoners the, of the, the chance for a bargain. They say that if you tell us that your partner in crime committed the crime, then you will go free and this other partner will get three years in jail. Otherwise, if you both stay silent, you will get one year in jail each, or if you, if you tell on each other, you will get two years each. So, the possible scenarios are the following, that we have both A and B betrays each other, two years each. Uh, we have another scenario where A betrays B, but B stays silent. That is, that one cooperates and one defects. Then we will get the zero years for A and three years for B. And the second, the last scenario, is when both A and B deny, and they cannot be charged with the principal crime, so they only get one year each. So how do we think about this problem then? Uh, we can write off what we call a payoff matrix. And this payoff matrix for this problem looks like this. So, here we have where A stays silent and B stays silent and so on. You get the gist of it. And how does one, an rational player of this game, think? Well, irregardless of my choice, I know that prisoner B will choose either to betray me, in which case I get three years if I don't betray him, but I only get two years if I betray him. So obviously, I should betray him. In the other scenario, prisoner B will stay silent. Uh, and in this case, I can get either two years for also staying silent, or zero years for betraying him. So it's obvious that in this setup, I should always betray the other prisoner. Now this can seem a bit counterintuitive given that the lowest total prison time is the 1-1, one, one, where they both stay silent, they cooperate. But in fact, we have an equilibria where both defect. That is, they cannot make their own situation any better by changing their action. All right, that was the first example of game theory. Now, uh, what is game theory? Well, game theory in the Wikipedia article is uh, proclaimed to be the study of strategic decision making, or the study of mathematical models of conflict and cooperation between intelligent, rational decision makers. Now, we live in a world where we have uh, conflict and cooperation between intelligent decision, decision makers all the time. So, if we could set up a system to analyze these kind of models, it would be of great importance. Now, to define this kind of a system, we need four elements. We need to know who are the players, we need to know what is the information in the system, we need to know what are the actions available to the players, and also, lastly, what are the payoffs for the different actions, or the different scenarios, rather. This is what we need to define a game or a model in game theory. Now, a question one likes to ask themselves while studying these kind of situations, are there equilibria in the system? Or are there no equilibria in the system? In that case, in which scenario do the equilibria arise, and how can we analyze them? I will talk more about the equilibria and give you more examples of equilibrium in game theoretic models. Um, also, game theory is quite a young science, so to speak. It's been around since the 1940s, 1950s, so there's still a lot to do. Uh, and applications of game theory. Well, we can apply game theory to economics, where we model situations such as bargaining, or auctioning, or things like this where we have interaction between intelligent decision makers who want to buy or want to sell. 
and also there's a lot of information exchange going on, which I will discuss more later. Uh, we have applications within biology, where one often talks about evolutionary game theory, where instead of maximizing profits or uh, set or prison time, uh, one instead wants to maximize chances for survival or fitness. Uh, political sciences also also apply game theory to some degree. We have, for example, the the game theorist Anthony Downs, who, in his uh, paper, proved that the the most successful political candidate would converge to the median opinion of all the voters. Now, we don't have this uh, in society because we do not live, live in a purely rational world, but uh, it's, a, it's a great thought, I think. Uh, of course, there are many more applications than the ones I just listed. Uh, also, there have been eight Nobel Prize laureates in economics for game theorists, so if you're interested in Nobel Prize in economics, maybe game theory is your piece of cake, I don't know. Uh, now moving on to yet another example. This example is called two-thirds of the average, and the rules are quite simple. You are supposed to guess two-thirds of the average of everyone else's guess. Now you get to choose numbers in the range 0 to 100. So without speaking to anyone else, what do you do? Or what is your guess, rather? Well, let's think about it. Um, if everyone else would guess 100, I would guess 66.67. And now that I know this, then I should guess two-thirds of 66.67. But given that everyone else also knows this, I would guess two-thirds of 44.43. And, and so on, until we go to zero, because that would be the rational guess. However, as I said before, we do not live in a purely rational world. Actually, there was a Danish newspaper uh, who carried out this competition. They had a cash prize of 5,000 Danish crowns and about 20,000 competitors. And the, actual, the winning guess was not zero, uh, but 21.6. Now, I don't know what this proves, if, if it proves that Danes are irrational or people in general are irrational. That's up to you. Um, moving on from the two-thirds of the, oh, also I can tell you that there is a site two-thirds of the average dot creativitygames.org I think and there you can play to guess two-thirds of the average there's a new round every day you can see how well you fare at this game uh, next example is the stag hunt now if you as me b beforehand didn't know what a stag was this animal here is a stag and uh, the premise is the following two players or hunters uh, they go out into the forest together and independently of each other, they decide if they want to hunt stag or hag. Now, of course, there's something in this game for them to win or earn, and that is um, money units or food units or whatever unit you would like to measure your success of hunting in. And the stag is quite a tricky animal, so you have to be two. You have to cooperate with each other in order to catch the stag. And without talking to your fellow hunter, how do you decide what to do? Well, uh, we could go about analyzing this just as we did to the prisoner's dilemma, because so as some of you may have thought or noticed, it's quite similar, but there is a m important difference that I will talk about. Uh, the payoff matrix looks like this, where we have cooperation, stag stag, we have cooperation or defection defection, har har, and then we have the symmetrical cases in between. Now, in this system, we have two equilibria. And these equilibria, in general, in game theory, we call Nash equilibria. The Nash equilibria is defined as following. Uh, if each player who has chosen a strategy and no player can benefit by changing strategies while the other players keep theirs unchanged, then the current set of strategies, strategy choices and the corresponding payoffs constitute the Nash equilibrium. Now that was a long sentence, but what it means is that if everyone else does the same, I cannot improve my own situation by switching. So is this true in this situation? Well, we have stag stag. If I choose to hunt hare instead, then I would drop. I would only get one instead of two. Or if we are in the hare 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 situation, if I choose to hunt stag instead, then I would get zero instead of one. So obviously, in this case, we have two Nash equilibria. Now this is, this is uh, different from the prisoner's dilemma in the sense that 
we only had one Nash equilibrium in the prisoner's dilemma, defect, defect, while here we have two, cooperate, cooperate, and defect, defect. And we can also think about the stag hunt in, in a more general scenario where we have a lot, a lot more hunters and a lot of different prey. And maybe some of the hunters talk to each other and maybe some of the hunters don't talk to each other. We can maybe think of this as an economical model where we have a share market with a lot of investors and a lot of shares and the information is not communicated across to everyone at the same time. It's important about information, one perhaps does not think of it, but it, it affects the decision you make as a rational decision maker in, in many ways. For example, if we talk about uh, high frequency trading, it's very important to have your servers as close to the Nasdaq exchange as possible, because then you would get the information fractions of seconds earlier than the others, and you could make more intelligent choices than the others, perhaps. And this was the stag hunt example. Now we are moving on to the Alfaro bar problem. I'm sorry there's a lot of text on this slide, but uh, it can be summarized in, into the following. We have uh, in Santa Fe, you say, there's a, a bar called the Alfaro bar, and every Thursday they play music, and it's a really nice place to be, so you want to go there rather than staying home. But there is one problem though, that the sand, the Enfiral bar gets crowded quite fast. So if it's above, it's, if more than 60% of the population go to the bar, then you will have a better time if you stay at home. But if less than 60% of the population went to the bar, you will want to go to the bar. Now we can relate to this situation, it's not that nice being in a really, really crowded bar, then you'd rather stay at home and so on. And how, how can we think about this problem in a game theoretic way? Do we make a, a payoff matrix like in the previous cases? It's, it's quite hard, if we, if we imagine that we have 100 inhabitants of Santa Fe, then this payoff matrix would be dramatically larger than the one we considered for the prisoner's dilemma. Also, we would not get the same intuitive, uh, intuitive way of describing the system as we did with the prisoner's dilemma. So what one rather does in this situation is one turns to models. And in this case, I am going to show you an agent-based model. And this agent-based model was not written by me. It's part of the NetLogo standard library for models. And it works in the following way. Uh, each agent, there are 100 agents in the simulation, each agent predicts, predicts the attendance levels for each week. And the predictions are based on history, and he uses the best strategy for the previous week to predict the next week's attendance levels. And each strategy is a set of weights corresponding or respecting how an agent interprets the history. So if I think that maybe three weeks ago is very important as to the attendance next week, then that weight would be larger and so on. Uh, and the, the weights are initiated as random numbers between one and zero. Uh, one one agent, he chooses the action dependent, depending on the prediction. So if I think that there will be more than 60% attendance at the bar, I will not go. Or if there will be less, I think there will be less, I will go. And he only utilizes one strategy at any given time. So he always uses the one that was best the previous time. Now, let's see what we can find with this model. So this is what it looks like. Here is the bar. And here is outside the bar where all the people are at. Here we will see the time evolution for the bar attendance. And we can start off by giving them a memory size of one and only one strategy each. Now the memory size of one is that I only remember last week and I only have one way to interpret this history. So we set up and then we go. Now what happens here is that quite rapidly we find ourselves oscillating about some given value. Now this is because all the agents, they only have one strategy each. So they will always make the same prediction on the, on the attendance level. Now the reason because that we have oscillations here is that because when he gets, when one or, it seems like it's two. So when, when two of the agents get this attendance level for the previous week, 
then they think it will be full and they don't go, so therefore it drops by two. And then this week they think it will not be full, so they decide to go instead. So this is maybe not very fun to, uh, to uh, analyze and to look at. Rather, we would like to complicate the system a bit. We increase the memory size to, let's say, five weeks. And then we increase the number of strategies to, let's say, six. So now what we have is a system where each one of these 100 agents, they have six set of weights, and each set is representing how important the five different memory slots are. So let's see what happens in this system. Set up and go. Now what we see is a system that is evolving as a, as a quite complex system. I mean, we can see here that just from this simple rule, go or not go, then we get a system which is, which is very hard to describe in the way of payoff matrix. But we can see here in the model that Obviously, we oscillate somewhere around this critical level. And I guess what I wanted to show was how the, si the simple set of rules can lead to a system which is quite complicated and quite hard to see what will, what will happen or what, we will, what effects we will see. Now, I have another model for you. And this model is actually one that we, uh, me and another student, wrote together for an assignment in the course that uh, all of us has taken. Uh, the co course is called uh, Simulation of Complex Systems. And this model uh, describes the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Now, it's the same prisoner's dilemma that I talked about before, but we do it many times, just after each other. So, the strategies in this case is how long do I defect before I start cooperating? Or rather, uh, how long do I think I can... How long do I think I can cheat my neighbor? Now, in the beginning, the, the, the agents are placed on a 32 by 32 lattice, and the strategies are divided randomly, and they, each neighbor plays its von Neumann neighbors, that is, to the top, bottom, left, right, and then the diagonals as well. And we have periodic boundary conditions, so the one on the farthest right plays the one on the farthest left, and so on. And they play seven rounds each, and then after they play the seven rounds, they consider all their neighbors, they say, they say who got the highest score, and then they adapt their strategy. And with some, some probability, let's call it a mutation, they do not accept this new strategy. And then we iterate this a couple of times. So let's see what happens. Now we see that here that the different colors, they represent the different strategies. And we can see that in the landscape we have kind of fronts moving about with the different strategies. And I'm sorry that I didn't put the color bar to represent the different strategies, I should have done that. But anyway, we can see how, how we get a landscape that's changing from iteration to iteration and how small islands can migrate or blow up or die out. Now, this is quite interesting. Remember, we only had the simple prisoner's dilemma game, and this is only seven rounds. I mean, if we take this to uh, uh, another dimension, or if we, if we take it even further and prove, play many more rounds or have different set of strategies, how will the landscape evolve? Now, if we consider this simple system uh, of, uh, of rules, which is the prisoner's dilemma, and compare it to an everyday situation like uh, choosing the right or the left side on the sidewalk, which do I choose? Oh, the last time I did this, and this happened, and so on. I mean, it's quite a simple, quite, quite a simple system in comparison with reality, and we get this complex kind of behavior. So, what I've talked about today is that game theory, we can model interactions. We have different set of strategies, and there may or may not exist equilibria in this process. So, the question is now, what do you want to model? Thank you. Great. Awesome.